parent, I went and stared into an iPad to announce my victory speech. It's unlike anything I'd ever been through in a campaign, and I said so. It was an extraordinary campaign experience, made even more difficult and challenging because of the pandemic crisis. I want to thank um, the people of the state for standing by me and giving me this chance to serve again. I'm honored to serve my state in this body, especially during this time of transition in America and transition around the world. Together with the trust in science that the Biden and Harris administration will return to our national agenda, I'm eager to continue my work to help the family, small businesses, schools, hospitals, and constituents in my state and help all of us in this country endure this pandemic together. COVID-19 did not take a day off for the election. While election week was brewing and all of us were glued to our television screens, most of the country was unaware of the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic was worsening. Cases of the virus and hospitalizations in the United States have been spiking for weeks now. On Saturday, we hit the highest daily total of new cases, 126,000 new cases on Saturday. In Illinois, we are approaching half a million cases, and the state has tragically seen more than 10,000 of our neighbors and friends die from this COVID-19. The country is on a pace to hit 1 million new cases every week by the end of this year. This is disastrous, and it demands action. Thankfully, President-elect Biden has announced an extraordinary task force of respected public health and medical experts truth tellers, real leaders, like the NIH's Dr. Fauci. I trust Dr. Kessler, David Kessler, whom I've known for decades. Dr. Morita, who served so admirably in the city of Chicago. Dr. Atul Gawande, one of my real heroes in medicine today. I spent a lot of money on his books and never regretted a penny of it. Former Surgeon General Murthy, what an extraordinarily talented man he is and the others who are part of the team. But we need to continue to stay safe and remember that this virus is no, not anywhere near being gone. 10 million Americans have now contracted the virus. We've lost 238,000 American lives. My heart goes out to everyone who's lost someone in this pandemic and to those still suffering due to this virus. In addition to the health and safety of the American people, We've also been struggling to deal with real economic uncertainty, job loss, food insecurity, stress and childcare. It's a long list. Despite these urgent needs of families, small businesses, workers, health providers, and unemployed Americans across the country, unfortunately, the leadership in this chamber has dragged its feet and offered only a few very weak measures that barely address the overwhelming needs of this nation. That's why Americans have not received another round of economic impact payments, rental assistance, or enhanced employment assistance, and why hospitals are not receiving additional funding. Speakers Pelosi and House Democrats passed the HEROES Act in May, a $3.4 trillion relief package. After negotiating with the White House, they then passed the second version of that, a $2.2 trillion package. Unfortunately, the Senate Majority Leader, Senator McConnell, refused to consider even either of these proposals and even refused to attend negotiating sessions. The last Senate Republican response was inadequate. $500 billion may seem like a fortune until you look at a nation in the midst of a pandemic and an economy struggling to survive. If Republicans are serious about negotiating a real package, if they want to demonstrate to the American people what leadership looks like with real solutions for real problems families face, then I call on Senator McConnell to show up at the negotiating table, give up the rogue attempts to pass empty, half-hearted measures. Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Jerome Powell, a conservative Republican economist, has repeatedly warned of potentially dire economic consequences if additional fiscal relief is delayed. As hiring begins to pick up in a few sectors, thank goodness, too many population, including African-American workers, Hispanic men and women with children, are being left behind. We need to focus on helping the American people through this pandemic. 
We need to do it now. This is a so-called lame duck session between the results of an election and the swearing in of a new Congress and president. But shame on us if we don't use this time together in Washington as an opportunity to do more than vote for a random Republican judge. Can't we roll up our sleeves on a bipartisan basis and realize what's really happening across America as this pandemic heats up and more Americans die every day? We need at least $75 billion for additional testing and contact tracing to slow the spread of the COVID-19, far more than the meager $16 billion that was offered in the Republican measure. We also want to put $57 billion in for hospitals, clinics, and health providers. Just a couple weeks ago, I was on the phone with these administrators. They're desperate. We're going to lose hospitals across this country, and I, I fear maybe even in our own state if we don't step forward and do something. And what's wrong with increasing, at least to some degree, the amount available for food stamps, the so-called SNAP program, so that hundreds of millions of Americans going to food banks to survive get a helping hand? Is that too much to ask in the month of Thanksgiving or the month of Christmas? And we must include more economic support for households through a second round of economic impact payments and reinstating enhanced unemployment benefits. I continue to hear from hospitals on the brink, workers who've lost their jobs, small business owners desperately trying to keep their heads above water about their struggles. Fortunately, unfortunately, the Senate continues to waste time on proposals to place the need of big businesses ahead of the need of small families. History will judge this body on how we respond, not on the best speech given on the floor or how we fail to respond to the worst pandemic in a century and the deepest recession in 75 years. The American people are looking for leadership. We cannot let them down. Mr. President, there's another aspect of this that I would like to address for just a moment. After each presidential election, there is a transition period when a new president is coming in, where his team takes a look at the government as it stands and prepares for the day of January 20th, when that new president is about to be sworn in. All of the networks and major news sources have declared Joe Biden president-elect and Kamala Harris, our colleague here from the Senate, as vice president-elect. They are now bringing together the people who are their experts to prepare for a smooth, orderly transition. But before that can take place, the administrator at the General Services Administration must file something called an ascertainment that ascertains, in fact, there was an election and someone won. In most cases, it's very routine. It's just done automatically based on the reports from states that we already have as we sat busily by the TV day after day doing our emails and texting to friends and families waiting for the returns to come in. The announcement was made on Saturday. The reaction was all across the country. You would think that the administrator of the GSA would have the ascertainment necessary to really pull the trigger for a transition from the Trump administration to the incoming Biden administration. These are routine things that have gone on in past years without really much controversy. But lo and behold, this year, there's controversy. For the past 60 years since Congress passed the Presidential Transition Act, to ensure a smooth, orderly transfer of power, the GSA administrator has usually ascertained the apparent winner within 24 hours of the election. By passing the Presidential Transition Act, Congress has acknowledged how critical this period is for safety and well-being of the country. Once GNA, GSA makes this ascertainment, the executive branch can provide crucial services to the transition team to make sure there's a smooth transfer. Remember what I mentioned earlier, we're in the midst of a pandemic with thousands of people dying. Why would we want to see a delay or some bureaucratic indecision that might jeopardize a person's health, a person's life in the midst of this pandemic? Once the GSA makes that ascertainment to provide critical services, it includes access to classified information for incoming national security officials, background investigations and security clearance for potential nominees, State Department facilitated foreign leader calls, access to SCIFs and to federal agencies for discussions on personnel budget policy, 
access to $6.3 million of congressionally approved funds to support transition activities and actually buy office equipment. A delayed ascertainment, as I mentioned, could also prevent the transition team from meeting with agency officials responsible for the COVID-19 crisis. Shouldn't they get up to speed on Operation Warp Speed and the announcement today by Pfizer that they're on the verge of announcing a successful vaccine? Don't we want an orderly, peaceful, smooth, effective, efficient transition when it comes to the manufacture and distribution of that vaccine? Of course we do. A delayed ascertainment will cause major harm to this transition to the new Biden administration and to the American people. It could be a danger to our national security. Why would we ever risk that? Vice President-elect Dick Cheney said on November 27, 2000, when there was an actual controversy in the states and in the courts, over five or 600 votes in Florida, for example, he said about the transition being delayed at all, quote, we'll pay a heavy price for the delays in planning and assembling the next administration. Mr. President, it's been a bitter campaign, a tough campaign. People still have very strong personal feelings about its outcome. Some people are euphoric and others are angry and sad. And I know that's natural in an election campaign. I feel that way about some of the races back in my home state. But there comes a moment where we have to look to the best interests of this country. And the best interests of this country say that we should move forward on the transition at this moment. I believe that President-elect Joe Biden will be sworn in on January 20th as our next president. I believe the numbers are overwhelming. The margins and even the controversial states are so large, they're not likely to be overturned by any recount. Why delay the transition? Why run the risk that we won't have a smooth, orderly, and efficient passage from one administration to the other? Why, in the middle of a pandemic, which has killed over 200,000 Americans and threatens over 100,000 more before January 20th, would we ever risk it over some bureaucratic delay? It's just unacceptable. The American people know the election's over. Now it's time for us in Washington to concede that point. It's time for the administrator of the GSA to do her job and to announce the ascertainment and move forward in an orderly, productive, and smooth transition. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Suggest the absence of a call. The clerk will call the roll.